Hello everyone, this is James Shore with another Test Driven Development video. Today is September 19th, it's Monday, and I'm starting a new batch of episodes. Uh, I wanted to start out by saying, giving a shout out to Esco Lontula, who has been going through all the back episodes up to this point and just putting a huge number of comments on them and even submitting some code patches and a video response. Um, really interesting stuff. Uh, thank you, Esco, for your, for your comments. I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on the video going through them, and I'm actually going to post, Esco had a video response, I'm actually going to post that as a separate video uh, after this one, and I'll link it uh, here so you can so you can see it. Uh, so I'm going to take a few minutes to go through that, and then we're going to look at some of the other um, fix-up stuff that we need to do before we dive into doing new features. So first off, uh, Esco Lantola is, um, he's the author of a video series called Let's Code, Dim Dwarf, and several other Let's Code series. Uh, pretty extensive stuff. I recommend you take a look at it. That's at uh, orfjackal.net so, uh, slash Let's Code. Uh, so the first the first comment he made was, uh, he, or the actually the last, most one of the most recent comments on episode 132, uh, he did this very interesting approach where he converted the way I'm creating dollars in my test to use what he calls a DSL, domain-specific language. And uh, I think this is an interesting topic because DSLs are very popular right now. And I actually tend to disagree with using DSLs, so this will be something to talk about. But let's let's take a look at what Esco's done. I think it's I think it's some neat stuff. Uh, and like I said, he has posted a video response, and he's going to have. Uh, where he goes through the thought process he uses to come up with this with this approach, and um, I'm going to include that in my playlist so you can see it. But first, what he's done essentially, I've got the the diff here, but let's let's actually look at the tree. Um, let's see. The main thing that he's done here is in dollars, he's created this new method called dollar, um, which is very clever because in Java, a dollar sign a symbol is actually a valid symbol uh, for or valid part of a symbol. So you can put it in a method name like he does here. Uh, it's a little bit too tricky because I know that the some of the Java compilers use it internally, so personally I wouldn't use the dollar sign, but it is very clever. And what, what this allows him to do is it allows him, let's go back to the diff, um, it allows him to change the way we create dollars to just say dollar, dollar sign and then the value. And what he's done is he, the, the, the motivation for this as I understand it, was to uh, eliminate here, I think it's invalid dollars test. Yeah, invalid dollars test, we had all these um, all these variables. We had $20, we had $0. This was something I did in episode 132. He didn't care for that approach, and so he basically inlined it. So now he says addition, $40 is $10 plus $3. It's very nice. It's very clean. Uh, it's quite clever. The way he makes this work is uh, by doing a static import. Um, and so that's that's what it is. Now, I'm a little torn on this. So I said that I'm not a big fan of DSLs, and let, let me tell you why. Uh, and, be, and that's the reason I'm a little torn on this change. Uh, and I'm not sure yet if I'm gonna if I'm gonna pull it in or not. Um, so the problem I have with DSLs, DSLs are all the rage. Now, there's there's two types of DSLs. Uh, Martin Fowler has written a book on this, but I haven't read it yet. But my understanding is that he classifies DSLs in two ways. He calls them external DSLs and internal DSLs. Now, I might be getting that, that wrong. Um, but basically, there are two kinds of DSLs. There's the true DSL. You know, 10 years ago, if you talked to somebody about a domain-specific language, what they would be talking about is a little custom language. So it would have its own grammar, its own parser, and to, to create this language, you would write a compiler. Uh, 
That's the true form of a domain-specific language. Um, and HTML could be considered domain-specific langu domain language. SQL could be considered domain-specific language. Lots of, lots of tools shipped with their own DSLs, and most of them were terrible. Uh, I remember way back when I first started programming, my first programming job, I think it was 1994, um, we used a, a, a modem program, I forget what it was called, um, Procom or something like that. It had a little C-like language in it uh, that was a domain-specific language that you could use to script this terminal program that was used to dial modems and dial up to, uh, and to host bulletin board systems and so forth. Um, and I wrote a little program in there to handle insurance, electronics insurance and claims or something like that. The problem with these old-fashioned domain-specific languages, the external DSLs, is that it's a lot of work to make something that's really complete. Uh, quite often, you end up with a very bad language. And actually, FIT, uh, the Framework for Integrated Tests, which is now um, mo more commonly used in its fitness uh, in incarnation, fitness, um, which is hosted by Object Mentor. I was involved in FIT in the early days, and FIT is a domain-specific language as well. It's got these HTML tables that you can use to specify tests. Um, anyway, if you're if you're not familiar with FIT, I'm, I imagine this isn't making a lot of sense. But the point is, is this Procom DSL fit as a DSL. They all have these sort of fundamental limitations, which is that they get basic computer science stuff wrong most often. Uh, I don't remember the details, but I don't think the Procom, the Procom DSL, for example, did stacks right. So you couldn't do recursion. Uh, it had loops, but you couldn't do recursion. Uh, fit was never meant to be a full feature programming language, so it didn't have variables, it didn't have loops, it didn't have subroutines which turned out to be a problem, and Fitness, the fork of Fit and the, the, the spiritual successor to Fit, um, added all those things at the, at the cost of complexity and a really ugly syntax. Because remember, this is all written in HTML table text. So traditional DSLs have this problem that they are typically very bad languages. So in the more modern incarnation, we have internal DSLs. And an internal DSL is really nothing more than taking an existing language and being clever. And that's what bugs me about internal DSLs. So you can see that here. Uh, Esco has been very clever in that he's created uh, this dollar sign method. Now this is just a method and he's imported, he's done a static import on it and as a result, he can now do something that looks like a different language, where Java doesn't you know, normally allow you to do something like, say, $40, say $40 in this way, but because of the way ESCO has um, worked the system, he's made it work. In, internal DSLs are really just clever names. Uh, in languages like Ruby that have a lot of flexibility and a lot of expressiveness, you can make some DSLs that are really look nothing like Ruby. A good example of that would be Rake, which is a programming, which is a library for Ruby that allows you to do builds, uh, like make files or or Maven or something like that, or Ant. Um, it's it's a make file system for Ruby, and when you look at Rake files, they don't look like normal Ruby code unless you really understand Ruby. So. Um, this is, I'm, this is all, I'm just speaking off the top of my head, so I apologize for this not being super well organized or clear, but the problem I have with internal DSLs is that, the problem I have with internal DSLs is that they are clever hacks on a language. And as a programmer, if I know a language well, like I know Java, I know Java fairly well, I wouldn't say I know it as well as I used to because I don't keep up with the latest on it. But if I know Java well, then I can figure out how to tweak the language so that it reads like a different language. But I don't think that this is actually a benefit. Because somebody who's only a moderate programmer of Java, Java won't necessarily understand why is it possible to have a dollar sign in Java. So this is actually making the code more obtuse. It's 
in, in my mind, the value of a programming language is that it is a rigorously specified system. If you understand a language and you see something written it, you know exactly how the program is going to work. Now you often get that wrong because those programs are complex, but it's possible to look at it and really understand what's going on. As soon as you start going into the obscure corners of a language and pulling in a dollar sign and pulling in static imports, now you're making it harder for other people to understand. For what? Well, ESCO has saved a lot of typing. He saved a lot of typing and he's gotten rid of the uh, $20 concept that we had. So, um, yeah. He's gotten rid, well, I, I can't show it to you right now. Um, yeah, before we had $0, $20, minus $20. He's gotten rid of that and made something that reads a lot clearer, but I'm not sure that it's actually easier to understand. Uh, I don't know that the code is actually better. Now, as he was going through this, he, he had an intermediate step where rather than using the dollar sign, uh, he used USD. Uh, so he named his method USD. Now, that's, that's a little bit better. I like that better. Uh, so now he had something where you'd call dollars.USD and then pass in, you know, 40 or whatever. And alternatively, he could have uh, imported static that and said USD 40. I think for me that would be the halfway point. Uh, that would be a good compromise. It has the expressiveness of this without going into the sort of corners of the language and making something that's that's really clever but not necessarily easier to understand. Um, so let me see if I can sum up here. Uh, I'm not a big fan of DSLs. I'm not a big fan of domain-specific languages. There's two times two types of domain-specific language. External DSLs, the old-fashioned kind where you'd write a grammar and a parser and everything else. Those are usually poorly done, so I'm not a big fan of those because um, they often neglect important computer science concepts like recursion and variables and pointers and so forth. Internal DSLs are really just fancy ways of manipulating a programming language so it looks like a different language, but it isn't really. And I'm not a fan of those because if I'm working in a language, I understand that language. If I'm working in Java, I understand Java, but I'm not going to understand the half-baked language you've built on top of it. Uh, and that half-baked language, because it's not really its own language, it's going to have little corner cases where you have to put in a comma there, or you need to make sure to put parentheses here, or it won't work. So for example, if I put $40, the, the program will break. Uh, these parentheses are very important because this is really a method call. But um, that's what I mean by it being a half-baked language. It's not a real language. You can't really type $40. It's a hack on top of Java. The same is true in Ruby and in other languages where people write internal DSLs. So I like what Esco's trying to do here. I like the fact that he's trying to make the code a little more concise, a little less verbose, and bring those variables in so you don't have the, the need to have a variable called $20. Um, I think that making a DSL is not what I would have done. Now, in fairness, a lot of people do this and they think it's a really good idea, so I might, I'm probably a little away from the mainstream in my view here. But for me, the most important thing is maintainability by others and by myself, and uh, DSLs, I think, get in the way of maintainability. So I tend to use the features of the language in the way that they were intended to be used, rather than making different languages on top of an existing language. So um, it's been kind of a long conversation. I think DSLs are a really interesting point. I don't know if I've made myself clear. Uh, I, they're really popular right now. Uh, but I'm not in favor of them, which is why I wanted to talk about it. So I hope we'll have more of a conversation in the comments. Um, that's pretty much all the time we have today for this episode. I'm going to go and link in Esco's uh, description of how he came to this uh, point of view. And I want to be clear, I really appreciate Esco's uh, detailed look at some of the past episodes. And I'm not saying that this is, uh, that he's done the wrong thing here. I, I just thought this was a really interesting springboard for talking about the utility of DSLs. Now, uh, Esco did make some comments on some other aspects 
of the system, including coming up with a what looks like a pretty clever way of testing an icon. Um, go ahead and go back through some of the previous episodes. You'll see his comments. Um, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thanks very much, everybody, for watching. Next time, we'll pick up some, with some more coding. I'll have to see you then.